And um, one of the, uh, the key aspects of the spinal cord's anatomy is that it creates the spinal nerves. So remember that the, the dorsal root um, and the ventral root, the dorsal root carries sensory information, the ventral root carries motor information. They combine together and they form the spinal nerve. And then the spinal nerve splits um, and goes uh, through or becomes the uh, dorsal ramus and the uh, ventral ramus. All right. So what happens to those then? Well, in, in uh, several parts of the body, the dorsal, um, sorry, the ventral rami of multiple spinal nerves join together and then split back apart to form these complicated networks of nerves called plexuses. Okay, now, uh, and there's four of them, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the connection is still point to point. In other words, um, there's a cell body in the spinal cord and its axon goes to just one place in the body. But in these plexuses, the, the nerve that that axon travels through um, uh, can change. It, it, it may travel through multiple different nerves to arrive at its uh, destination. All right. Um, now, the, uh, the plexus is, is some of the most complex anatomy that there is, and in a lot of uh, college courses, you're expected to learn that stuff. I don't have you learn the, the plexus is, um, because I don't think that all the parts are important, but I do have you learn some of the, the, the final nerves that come out of the plexus. So in the next few slides, you're going to see red boxes around certain nerves. Those are the nerves that I want you to know. Um, I want you to know uh, really their anatomy, in other words, where they are, uh, what the course is. And then when we get to the, um, uh, the hand, I want you to know the sensory distribution as well. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. All right. So where are the four plexuses? Well, we have a cervical plexus um, up here in the neck. Um, the cervical plexus uh, provides the nerves that move the head around. Um, they also provide uh, the nerves that uh, control the diaphragm, so the phrenic nerve, one of the most important nerves in the body. Um, uh, and a, a little bit of the uh, uh, positioning of the scapula, uh, namely the trapezius. Okay, so we have the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, which is right about here, um, uh, is for the arm, so the upper extremity, and the uh, pectoral girdle. Um, all right. And then uh, the lumbar plexus uh, and sacral plexuses, they're both for the leg. So the lumbar plexus really uh, creates the nerves that run the front of the leg and the sacral plexus uh, for the, the posterior part of the leg. All right. So we'll look at each of these in turn. All right. So you can see here, you know, see one, two, three, four, and five. So here are the spinal nerves, right, that are emerging from the spinal cord just like we saw in that uh, in the diagram last time. And then these spinal nerves, they start uh, mixing together, so to speak. So you can see that we've got this complicated pattern of nerves coming together and then splitting apart. So that's what we mean by a plexus. A plexus is just a network of nerves or a, a, a complex pattern. Well, what, what emerges from this mixing of spinal nerves are then um, uh, the nerves that actually go somewhere and do something. So in this picture, there's only two red boxes. One is the great auricular nerve, which is right here. And it's um, important simply because it, uh, it courses just anterior to the external acoustic meatus. Um, so just in front of the, of the ear hole, so to speak, is this great auricular nerve. And it goes up and it supplies the temporalis muscle. Uh, which is one of the, the uh, chewing muscles. And then running along here, running along the side of the spinal cord, we have what may be the most important nerve in the body, and that's the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm, and the diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. So the diaphragm won't contract without um, a nervous system signal to do so. So the phrenic nerve controls our breathing. Um, if we don't have a phrenic nerve, the diaphragm is paralyzed and the patient is dying. So 
Um, the phrenic nerve is very well protected because it, it literally sits right next to the spinal column. So it isn't damaged uh, very often, except in surgery. Um, in cardiothoracic surgery, they're always very careful to identify and preserve the phrenic nerve because without it, we have one side of the diaphragm that isn't working. So there's a phrenic nerve on each side. There's a left and a right. And it emerges from the cervical plexus. So even though the diaphragm is way down in the center of the trunk, the nerve that runs it emerges all the way from the, uh, the neck all the way at the top um, and then courses down. All right, so we, that's the cervical plexus. All right, the uh, brachial plexus. Um, uh, we start with C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. And then you can see that the spinal nerves join together to form these trunks. And then they kind of split and join again to form these cords. And then eventually we get um, the named nerves that emerge from the other end. Um, so this is, again, sort of a, classical, a classic plexus or mixing, uh, mixing network of nerves. All right. So we have um, an ulnar nerve and a radial nerve that travel along the bones they're named after. So the radial nerve travels along the radius. The ulnar nerve travels along the ulna. So that one's not surprising. The median nerve travels sort of along in the middle of the arm. That's why it gets its name, median nerve. Um, and the uh, musculocutaneous nerve, which is up here, it um, uh, travels and supplies for sort of the upper part of the um, arm. So the, uh, uh, between the shoulder and the elbow is primarily the musculocutaneous nerve. All right. So the median, ulnar, and radial nerves are of particular importance because they provide for the hands. So the hands, the um, uh, sensation and motor control of the hand is uh, uh, carried through the ulnar nerve, radial nerve, and median nerve. Um, the median nerve is the one that passes through the carpal tunnel. You know, we talked about that when we talked about um, joints and uh, bones. So the median nerve has to share that uh, very tight space with all the ligaments for the flexors of the fingers. So in carpal tunnel syndrome, the, um, the problems uh, that are associated with it are all from the median nerve. So if you encounter a patient who has that, what they're going to have is they're going to have numbness, tingling, and weakness in these yellow parts of, the, of this picture of the hand, because these are the parts that are provided for by the median nerve. It's called, the, uh, it's sometimes people joke, it's the million dollar nerve, um, and that's because if you cut it, that's uh, the check you're going to have to write to the patient. The reason for that is it, it controls the thumb. And without uh, mo motion of the thumb, you have a significant handicap, a, si a significant deficit in function. So um, the median nerve and the uh, uh, carpal tunnel uh, sort of go together. To look at the rest of the hand in pink here, so the, the pinky finger and the uh, one half of the ring finger, that's the ulnar nerve. And then the radial nerve pretty much just supplies the back of the hand. Um, so um, the back is mostly radial. The front is sort of split between the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. All right. So what can you do? I know that can you have surgery to stop carpal tunnel? Is yes, you, you can. They, can. they cut that the retinaculum to allow there to be more space uh -huh. in there. Yeah. But the best way to deal with carpal tunnel is to not get it. And that is, you know, when you're typing, your wrist should be straight like this, not like this. That's bad. This is good. This is bad. So um, it's one of the reasons why wrist rests got invented is to try to straighten the wrist. Because when your wrist is bent like this, the ligaments all have to make a bend. So they're always rubbing against the uh, uh, top side of that canal, and that's what causes the problem. All right. Down into the leg. Um, here, the... If you thought the brachial plexus was complicated, these two plexuses are even more so. Um, so uh, T12, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Here are the spinal nerves. And then they kind of make this pattern or network um, that come out. And then uh, the sacral nerves, same thing. We have spinal nerves that emerge um, from the sacrum. 
and then they kind of all join together, at least most of them, to form what is the largest nerve in the body, and that's the sciatic nerve, um, which runs down the back of the leg. So in red boxes here, we have red boxes again, so these are um, nerves you should know. The femoral nerve the, uh, provides for the anterior upper thigh, so um, like the, uh, the quadriceps muscles are provided for by the femoral nerve. Um, the femoral nerve sits right next to the femoral artery and femoral vein, which are commonly accessed vessels. So like Say you are having a heart attack and they want to try to save as much heart muscle as they can. One of the things that they'll do is they'll put a catheter in the femoral artery and vein um, to, to head up towards the heart to fix things. Well, when they're doing that, the last thing they want to do is put a needle in the femoral nerve. So um, one of the places the femoral nerve comes up is in line placement, which um, some of you will have a part of later on in your careers. All right. Um, the pudendal nerve um, comes around here to the side, and it uh, uh, supplies sensation to the genitalia. So in um, childbirth and circumcision, um, very commonly the pudendal nerve is blocked. In other words, um, anesthetic is put around that pudendal nerve to, to uh, cut the sensations coming from the genitalia. Um, the sciatic nerve coming along the back. Um, the saphenous nerve uh, runs along with a vein called the saphenous vein um, that goes the entire length of the inside of the leg. It's the longest, straightest vein in the body, and this nerve is also very long and straight because it goes right along with it, so saphenous nerve. The sciatic nerve runs along here in the back, and it is uh, quite large. You know, it's, it's about the same diameter as uh, somewhere between a nickel and a quarter. So it's a great big, huge um, nerve. You may have heard it talked about before in terms of sciatica, which is um, pain that shoots down the back of the leg. Um, it's very common uh, in um, uh, back injuries. So slip discs, um, uh, uh, crushed vertebrae, things like that. Um, the sciatic nerve uh, gets pinched along in here, and it causes pain that shoots down the back of the leg. All right. The sciatic nerve divides at uh, the knee into the tibial nerve on one side and then the sural nerve on the other. Now, unlike the hand, you don't need to know this stuff. I do want you to know um, this diagram. So there should be a big red box across this. So make a circle around that. <clears throat> but for the foot, it's not important uh, to know which parts of the foot are supplied by which of these nerves. All right. So, sacral lumbar plexus, sacral plexus. All right, a couple of questions. Uh, no, let me get set up here. Email. All right, nerve fibers in the phrenic nerves that innervate the diaphragm arise from which plexus? Good. Lots of you got that. That's B. So the phrenic nerve controls the diaphragm, key and critical to survival, you know, because the diaphragm, if the diaphragm doesn't move, air doesn't go in and out of the lungs. So you have a major problem. Um, and it arises very high up in the nervous system, so from the cervical plexus. So like uh, in a spinal cord injury case, um, you know, say there's been a car accident and somebody's uh, spinal cord is severed at T1. They can still breathe on their own because the phrenic nerve comes out so early in the spinal cord, so high up. So um, you have to have a very high uh, spinal cord injury to not have diaphragm control. All right. <clears throat> the brachial plexus supplies nerves to which of those things?
that is. Jump in there if you haven't already. All right, so that is C, muscles of the arm and forearm. So arm and forearm, that's all brachial plexus. The cervical plexus is mostly head muscles, muscles that move the head. And then the lumbar and sacral plexuses um, control the lower limb. All right. So the rest of this chapter is about reflexes, which are the, the simplest neural connections or the simplest things that the nervous system does. You know, remember that we talked about the overall scheme for the nervous system is that a stimuli goes in to the CNS, and what comes out is um, effector or motor, in other words, something the body's going to do. So what we're going to see in these reflexes is it's the simplest version of this, you know, because in, uh, in like what some of you are doing right now, you know, you're typing or you're reading or you're listening, this component might involve 100,000 neurons plus, so very complex between the stimuli that you're hearing from me and the effect, um, which is you know writing down or typing or making memory, let's hope. Um, but in reflexes, um, instead of having huge numbers of neurons, we have just a few there in the middle. But before we get into that, um, there are uh, numerous patterns of uh, uh, neural circuitry, essentially, or um, uh, how the, how neurons interact with other neurons. So one example is divergence, and this is where a single neuron may end up activating many, many neurons. So um, you can imagine that if you uh, uh, have a, a problem to solve, you're going to need to activate multiple neurons to make that happen. So we would call that divergent. In parallel processing, multiple neurons are working alongside each other. So they're working separately, but they're all working at the same time, and they're working on different things. So that's another. In serial processing, this is the, uh, kind of what we've looked at already. One neuron affects the next, and then the next, and then the next. So it's kind of a chain of effects. In convergence, um, this is where multiple neurons are all affecting one neuron. We talked a little bit about this pattern when we talked about IPSPs and EPSPs in the last chapter. <laughs> Um, how multiple neurons can be affecting a single um, neuron to either bring it to stimulus or bring it to threshold or not. This is a kind of an interesting pattern, reverberation. This is where a neuron is essentially stimulating itself. Um, so once it activates, it'll keep act, you know, it'll continue to activate until this neuron in the middle here makes some change and turns off that loop. All right. Okay, so in a, uh, in a simple reflex arc, we see that stimulus CNS effect. So here, you know, say the stimulus is you put your hand on something sharp. Well, that sensation is carried into the spinal cord through the um, uh, uh, afferent um, nervous system, um, through the dorsal root ganglion, and then we have a synapse. And here at this synapse, this white neuron is going to do two things. One, it's going to stimulate the motor region to pull that hand back. So uh, in just one connection from stimulus to effect, we have just one neuron in between the red and the black here, we've already created essentially an intelligent action, which is to pull the hand away from that thing that is sharp. Because if it were to continue uh, uh, as it was before, you'd end up with skin injury, right? So it makes sense to pull that um, arm back. And then in addition, this interneuron, which is what we call all neurons between stimulus and effect, are interneurons. There might be one, like in this case, or there might be 10 million, um, but they're all uh, interneurons. So in addition to stimulating the, uh, the muscle effect, this neuron is also going to notify the, the, the rest of the brain. You know, the brain is going to want to know that something sharp has just been on the hand so that it can engage in more complicated problem solving than just pulling the hand away. So um, well, we also get an activation of higher centers there. 
So essentially we have stimulus, activation of a sensory neuron, a little bit of information processing, you know, making something happen, um, and then activation of motor neuron, and then we get that response from the muscle, which is to pull that hand back. So this is the simplest uh, of the reflexes, and we call this the flexor reflex. Um, essentially, when uh, our limbs flex, they're pulled in closer to the body, so into a safer position. So um, oftentimes, you know, something that's very hot or very sharp or whatever, the response is you pull the arm away, you, you flex the arm. All right. Um, so there are lots of reflexes. Uh, so we classify them like we do lots of other things. One classification is whether you're born with them or whether you develop them. So we, uh, the ones you're born with, we call those innate reflexes. And the ones you um, develop or learn are acquired reflexes. So this, that simple um, uh, reflex withdrawal that we just looked at, you know, you, you touch something hot and you pull your hand back, you're born with that. Babies do that. Um, but uh, catching a ball, for example, you know, many of you, if I threw a tennis ball at you, you'd instinctively catch it before you'd let it hit you in the face, right? That's an acquired reflex. You're not born knowing how to do that. If any of you have ever played uh, uh, catch with a toddler, you may have encountered that, that they'll let it just bounce off their head because they haven't learned to catch it yet. <clears throat> All right, so innate and acquired. Um, the nature of the response, somatic versus visceral. When we talk about somatic, we're talking about typically it's things we can see. So um, uh, motor control, um, um, even glandular control, whereas visceral reflexes are all taking place about the organ, so inside. Um, we'll talk much more about visceral reflexes uh, in the autonomic nervous system chapter that's coming, and then you'll hear a lot more about this in AMP2 where you talk about how um, uh, the different organs actually work. All right. The, uh, we classify by complexity. So monosynaptic are the simplest. That's that reflex arc that we just looked at. One interneuron is involved there. Um, but most are polysynaptic. So they have, there are lots of connections between neurons, between stimuli and effect. Uh, and then where the reflex is. Does it occur in the spinal cord, like that flexor reflex, or does it occur up in the brain? So all the reflexes that occur in the spinal cord can be much faster because that, the signal doesn't have to travel all the way up to the brain and then back down again. Um, in the uh, nervous system, the, the longer a signal has to travel, the slower it's going to be um, able to do that because it just takes time to... Uh, for that action potential to propagate. All right. So probably the most frequently encountered reflex in the doctor's office or the hospital is this one. We call it the deep tendon reflex. And we've all had this done where the doctor takes his funny little uh, triangular hammer and, and whacks on your knee, and then your knee or your leg moves, your uh, calf moves. So how does that work? Well. Um, essentially what's being done is when the hammer strikes this tendon, it is stretching the quadricep muscle here on the top. Because here's the quadricep, its tendon goes across the knee and then attaches to um, the tibial tuberosity, which is right here. So when that hammer pushes on this tendon, the muscle is, is lengthened because the hammer is pushing here, the tendon is pulling um, the muscle and stretching it out. Now, they, we have an organ inside muscle um, called a muscle spindle. And what the muscle spindle does is it keeps track of a muscle's length. You know, when a muscle contracts, it gets shorter, right? Well, the brain kind of needs to know how long a muscle is in order to know what the position of the limb is. You know, is the uh, or is it flexed or extended? Well, one of the things the brain needs to know is how long the muscle is, and that's how the uh, the muscle spindle works. And it's um, the the complexities of how it works are really not important. Just know that muscle spindles um, uh, react to changes in muscle length. Now um, there is a let's see. 
Okay. So uh, when the muscle is the correct length, or the length the brain expects, this uh, uh, muscle spindle is going to send a signal to the brain like that. So kind of a, a regular pattern of action potentials. But if we take this muscle and we stretch it, like we do with the hammer when we hit the uh, uh, tendon, what happens is the muscle spindle starts um, sending signals faster. You know, you can see that there are more here than there are here. That's because the muscle is being stretched. If we compress the muscle, we get the opposite. The muscle spindle slows down its response. So when the um, uh, hammer comes, all right, um, the muscle spindle senses the stretch of this muscle. It increases its, uh, the number of times per second that it's firing, and that creates a stimuli that travels into the spinal cord. So in order for the brain to keep muscles at the right length, when a muscle is stretched, the brain sends a signal, or rather the spinal cord sends a signal, to increase the amount of contraction. You know, if you're trying to lift something, but instead of lifting it, it's, it's sinking, your muscles are getting longer. So what do you need? You need more contraction strength to, to keep that muscle in one place. So the response to muscle stretch is muscle contraction. So the uh, spinal cord triggers an increase in the quadriceps contraction. Now, because the hammer has hit very briefly, by the time that stretch stimuli creates a contraction response, the hammer isn't there anymore. So instead, the leg moves, you know, the, the tibia moves, because now um, that increase in contraction is going to make the, the leg go like that. And we've all experienced what that feels like, right? You know, they, they hit you in the knee, and your leg goes like this. Well, the reason is that stretch from the hit creates a contraction, which moves your foot um, up, which extends the leg a little bit, or extends the knee a little bit. All right. So this reflex is very fast um, because it only involves one synapse. So this is a monosynaptic reflex. Now, you might ask, why on earth do we do this all the time as part of the examination? The nice thing about the deep tendon reflex is if it's normal, it tells you that the nerve from the muscle is normal, and the nerve from the spinal cord back to the muscle is also normal. So it's a test of the peripheral nervous system. Are the nerves going into the CNS and coming out of the CNS, are they healthy? And if you get a um, normal deep tendon reflex, you know that. You know that the afferent division of the peripheral nervous system is okay, and the efferent division, at least as it, is, it involves the quadricep tendon. So, <clears throat> it's why we do uh, this reflex. So we call it the, the proper name is the deep tendon reflex or the stretch reflex. Um, but usually they're referred to as DTRs, deep tendon reflexes. Not to be confused with the tendon reflex. So this is one of these unfortunate happenings in medicine. So we have the DTR, the deep tendon reflex, is that stretch and response. The tendon reflex, also called the Golgi tendon reflex, is a different reflex that causes a muscle to um, relax when the tendon is stretched too much. So, for example, you've got a patient with Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's makes people very stiff and rigid, right? Well, if you and his arm is flexed. If you pull hard enough on his arm, the muscle will eventually relax and you'll be able to move it. That is the tendon reflex at work. Um, essentially, it's a protective reflex that keeps us from tearing our tendons. So before a tendon will tear, it'll tell the muscle it's attached to to relax so that um, the tendon doesn't tear and instead the limb just moves. So deep tendon reflex and tendon reflex are two different things. All right. Ooh. Okay, so that's one, the DTR. The um, flexor reflex, this is the one we've kind of already seen. Painful stimulus comes in through the afferent system. An interneuron um, sends the signal to the brain because we do need to know that something has happened. But then it also synapses, it has two synapses. 
um, at the uh, it synapses with the uh, flexor motor neuron, so that causes flexion, and it inhibits the extensors. So we have you know one, two, three synapses here. Um, the response is the uh, the joint flexes because the extensor is inhibited and the flexor is stimulated. So um, we want to do both of these things. You know, if we just uh, stimulated the flexor, if the extensor was busy doing something, you might not get any motion at all. So you have to have an inhibition and a stimulation in order to get that flexion response. All right. Is it delayed? Because whenever I put my hands in hot water, it's too hot. It takes a second for my hands to actually, like, get out of the hot oh, water. Oh, it's not supposed to be like that. It oh. should be quick. <laughs> all right, when we get to the legs, we have a, an additional complexity because if you just pulled your foot back, you'd fall over, right? Because your, your body weight is being supported by both feet. So in the legs, we have this thing called the crossed extensor reflex that involves both sides of the body. So when you go and you step on attack, ouch, right? That stimuli goes into the brain, dorsal root ganglion, into the um, uh, posterior gray horn. And here we have several different synapses. So this is polysynaptic. One is going to work on the leg that's been injured or is about to be. So the um, extensors will be inhibited and the flexors stimulated. So that we've already seen. That's no different than what you do with a hot pan, right? You flex um, uh, and uh, inhibit extension. On the other side, we get the opposite pattern. The extensors are stimulated and the flexors are inhibited so that the weight of the body can be held up. So once we pull our foot up, now the other leg is extended, the flexors are inhibited, so you haven't fallen over. If it wasn't for this crossed extensor reflex, if you did this, if you stepped on a tack and you pulled up, you'd, just, you'd fall to the side that you had stepped on something. So the crossed extensor reflex keeps you upright. And you can see that all this information is going up to the brain, too, because the brain wants to know everything that's happening in the body. So it wants to know its current state. So that has to be sent up to the brain so it can you know, decide to reach down and pick up the tax so it never does that again. All right. Some other ones. Um, uh, stretch reflexes, the one we're most familiar with is at the knee. But you can test DTRs at multiple other places, too. Um, you can test it at the biceps, you can test it at the tr uh, triceps, at the ankle. Pretty much any place that you can stretch a tendon, you can test a DTR. Um, and neurologists can get very creative at, um, at testing these at different places. So that's the DTR. Um, always with the same thing. The muscle that you're testing will contract and will pull um, that, uh, uh, the next bone in the direction that you're testing at. Uh, the abdominal reflex and the Babinski um, are a little more complicated neurologically because they involve the, uh, the sense of touch. So they're triggered by touch sensations. But if you take the back of the pointy hammer and you drag it along the abdomen, what the abdominal muscles on that side will contract. Um, it's a defensive response. Because remember, the abdominal muscles are uh, partially responsible for protecting the contents of the abdomen, right? So if something drags along them, they'll contract to try to protect what's underneath. Um, uh, so you have that one. And then the Babinski reflex, if you drag the back of the hammer along the bottom of the foot, you get one of two responses. Now in the normal healthy adult, you get this. You get the plantar reflex. So you can imagine that that maybe wouldn't be very comfortable, you know, kind of ticklish and not, not a, a very pleasant sensation. So in the adult, the response is to pull away from it. So the, um, uh, the, the toes curl down and the arch of the foot um, uh, increases to kind of move away from that stimulus. Now in the um, infant or the spinal cord damaged patient, you have uh, the opposite response. Instead of the toes going down, the toes flare up and out. And we call that the Babinski sign. So this, this reflex on the bottom of the foot 
is often mistakenly referred to as the Babinski reflex. It's not. Um, the Babinski sign is this pattern to the plantar reflex. So um, uh, we will we'll often uh, do a quick test. This is quick and easy to do, you know, because most of the time, like in the hospital, the patient doesn't have any shoes on and they're lying in a bed, right? So it's easy to test this. You just flip the sheet up and you can drag it across the foot. So in a trauma case, um, you might do this looking for spinal cord damage. If you see this, chances are the spinal cord is fine. If you see this, you are worried that the spinal cord has um, some injury, unless it's an infant. Because babies don't develop the normal until about six months, between six months and a year. So that's the Babinski sign or the Babinski reflex. All right. Okay, so let's do a few more questions. So initiating the withdrawal reflex in both legs at the same time would cause what to happen? Got to spread on this one a bit. All right, so this has to do with that crossed extensor reflex, which let's go back to this. Okay, so on the, on the side that is being injured, the extensors are inhibited and the flexors are stimulated to try to pull that foot away from the danger. If this happened on both sides, essentially you, you, the body would be trying to sit. I mean, you'd sit because if both legs had the same thing, they would flex, and then you, you would go like that, which of course would not help you get away from the nail at all, right? So um, in the crossed extensor reflex, the opposite leg is triggered to do the opposite action. So the extensors are stimulated and the flexors are inhibited. So in our question, um, the best answer would be B. It would cause you to fall, because uh, it's not going to help you maintain your posture. And it's not D because um, that's what is supposed to happen, which is uh, one side is opposite the other. All right. We've got another one here. OK. The patellar or knee jerk reflex is a classic example of which of those things? All right, that's pretty much everybody. And you're all getting it correct anyway. So C, the stretch reflex, also called the deep tendon reflex. Not to be confused by A, the Golgi tendon reflex um, triggers a, a muscle to stop contracting when its tendon is being stretched. Um, and the withdrawal reflex and crossed extensor reflex are protective reflexes, but we generally don't test for those. You know, it's not like the neurologist is going to, you know, stick you with a pin to see if you go like this. And the other thing is, um, these uh, uh, protective reflexes can be overcome by the set by the higher order brain functions. So, like, you know, if if you if somebody sticks you with a pin on purpose, you know, you're watching them do it. You're they're going to take your blood. Let's say you don't withdraw, right? And the reason for that is because the, the brain has taken control of those reflexes so that they don't happen. So you can learn to control any of these reflexes, but 
What's interesting is if when the body is startled by something, though, it's still going to happen because the brain has not prepared the spinal cord for that um, uh, response. We just talked about that. All right, that's it for today. We're going to get done.